person, John Coleman, uh, who uh, actually started smoking at the age of 112. Uh, uh, and uh, a little bit about, I did research a little bit about her. There was, there was some commentary, it's not really her, it's her daughter, etc. But I think now people think it really was her. Uh, and uh, you know, she grew up with a very low stress life, uh, very social, uh, she was wealthy. And um, lived an interesting life. And it seems like many things in biology, things seem to intersect at around about the 116, 118 kind of mark. You know, your telomeres, if you plot it out, uh, they seem to get smaller and smaller and they get to zero around about the 117 mark if you actually last that long. Uh, the oldest living person, and I have to update this just to double check every time I give a talk, uh, is um, Maria here, who was actually born in San Francisco. So you don't actually need to live in a blue zone to live a long time. Uh, she lives in Spain, however, having said that, uh, though born here. You can see articles like this in that well-known scientific journal, the Wall Street Journal, uh, uh, which uh, anecdotally a few weeks ago came up uh, with these numbers. And I guess up to 90, they're saying up to 25%, uh, 100, 50% is genetics, uh, 106, 75% is genetics. Um, I'd probably challenge that a little bit. Uh, sort of, again, you have to do a much deeper analysis of causation and correlation of what's actually happening over a 106-year-old life. If you started smoking at 112, could Jean Colmen got to, could, have, could she have got to 130 if she'd not done that? We don't know. Uh, and there's 79 organs in the body, and they all age differently. And how do we do this? And uh, and a lot of people ask me, Ron John, you know, you, you've researched this area in the longevity space, you've talked to all these scientists, well, what should we do? And I usually say, well, why don't we just start with this called level one? Let's just start with diet, exercise, and sleep, which most of us don't do at the optimum level. And then we can look at fancy stuff and look at what aging actually is. So aging, we have a number of diseases that are correlated with aging, and traditional biotech uh, from an investment point of view, looks at each of these diseases one at a time and tries to solve them one at a time. The other theory is, well, can we actually find something that fixes all these things all at once? And then we get 10 diseases sold for the price of one. So last week I was in uh, Saudi Arabia, so, and they announced the uh, $101 million X Prize. So I'll give a few comments on this. So just a few basics on this as you start looking at the uh, material, uh, any of us can apply, probably at this conference, maybe we can have little groups, can decide, because $101 million, $101 million is a lot of money, uh, but maybe we, need, maybe we don't want 20 people in a group, or maybe we want three people, how, how, do, how do we share it out? We'll have, we'll have to decide that. Uh, but the idea is to get extra minimum of 10 and, um, and up to 20 years increase in life for, 60, for people who are 65 to 80-year-olds who are free of disease and life-threatening um, uh, diseases and disability. Can they actually get uh, another 10 or 20 years? And they have to take the solution in one year or less and then prove three domains. So you could have a deba debate, you know, what domains uh, are uh, part of aging, but these are the three that were chosen in competition. Uh, cognition, uh, immune system, and muscle. Uh, and so I guess there's six months or so where you can actually comment on whether these are the right characteristics. But here's my comments on what we do. If we want to do it, win this prize, and I think R42, we will actually put an entry in. Uh, maybe Stanford will put an entry in. Maybe the Buck Institute will put an entry. There are lots of smart people here. Uh, and see, so what's my comments? So first of all, the competition lasts seven years. So if it's seven years, there's actually no time to invent a new drug from scratch. Uh, if you're on the way of inventing one, if you've got something that uh, is in a phase one, phase two, maybe, maybe they'll accept a phase two trial. Uh, so what's the implication of that? That means you're going to have to not invent a new drug. And, and this, this is known as drug repurposing. So there's a school of thought, we don't need to invent any new drugs. They've already been invented. We just have to use the existing ones in new combinations. Second idea is actually don't invent a drug, just come up with a regime. Uh, existing, you no, know, use diet, exercise, sleep, but that's easy to say, uh, but how do you do it optimally? Obviously, compliance would be very, is very, very difficult for most of us. 
a lot of us want to, uh, we know, sort of you know, restrict our sugar, you know, do intermittent fasting, do exercise, uh, but a lot of us don't do it. Uh, but what if we, asked, we were told you get $101 million if you do it for a year? Uh, you, might, you might actually do it uh, differently. Uh, mitochondria, that could be something, uh, a mitochondria transfer. Uh, so what this competition means, you'd have to actually look at things that can be done in a seven-year process. So it may not be optimum. There might be other things you can do that will take us longer, longer to do. And I really think there's the three inflection points. One is... AI, generative AI, uh, you know, we're now getting to the stage. I think the Star Trek view is eventually you won't need to do trials. The computer simulation is actually more accurate than the trial. Uh, and you're starting to see that in protein folding. When the protein folding uh, alpha fold came out, uh, people said, uh, uh, well, we know it, the simulation works because the experiments match our simulation. Now I'm reading papers the other way around. My experiments work. I know my experiments were right because it matches the computer simulation. So it's the other way around. If you look at it, play it forward, whether it's 100 years or 10 years, um, you'll generate your treatment in a computer. So that's an inflection point. Gene editing, the second inflection point. We're just getting the first gene editing uh, therapies. The only problem, the dirty secret is, is getting complex gene edits uh, and... Uh, is most diseases have a long tail of genes, not just one gene. So you want to get more than that. It's, got, it's very, very inaccurate toxicity. But there's a mini industry of a new generation, of second generation companies that are trying to generate complex edits. Can we get that in the seven years? Not sure. Uh, we talked about mitochondrial transfer, um, epigenetics. Uh, I think there's speakers uh, later on who will talk about that. These are the Yamanaka factors. Yamanaka got the Nobel Prize. He said there's four things uh, that if you change, you can stay and change a cell from current state to uh, state zero. Uh, uh, actually, if you change three of those, it reduces... Uh, you, you, uh, the problem is four, if you do all four, you have some cancer risk, but three of them you have reduced cancer risk. So I'm voting with my feet, you know, um, R42. We've got a number of companies we've invested in and working with and uh, looking at trying to look at many of these things on a, uh, 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 in many dimensions. Uh, are you going to be able to find one thing to just fix everything, or is it going to be a combination, a cocktail of these things? My personal opinion, it will be a cocktail of these uh, different things. And we will then be able to crack this 90, 95 barrier. Uh, if you use diet, exercise, and a few medicines, uh, we can get to this 90, 95 barrier. The average age of death today is 76, down from 78, so average age is actually dropping. Uh, but because I went to MIT, I like numbers. Uh, the key word being average, there's actually more people hitting the age 100 than ever before. Uh, but that seems to be like the maximum. Maybe you can get to 110. We saw the 116 year old lady, the 122 year old, and a lot of biological phenomena. They seem to triangulate at that. Trying to get more than that is going to be uh, quite difficult. You know, everything we've seen today only gets to you know, the next 20 years or so. And uh, so I'm going to come up with this idea of a vaccine for aging. Uh, so people tell me, uh, okay, I'm, you're working on a vaccine. What's so special about that? Well, mine's for aging. Uh, and what does that actually mean? And if you can actually cure uh, aging, if you can actually do aging, you solve many diseases uh, all at once and increase that maximum uh, 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 date. And fundamental this is using artificial intelligence. Uh, we are at an inflection point there. Biologists can now do computer science. And guess what? Computer scientists can now do biology, right? It's, uh, it's you can actually, uh, the things that we're seeing now, there's a million papers published every year in medicine. Nobody's got time to read them. You can have a machine read them now and come out with innovations spit out by the machine that you would not have thought of by yourself. You can retrain on the health and age level. You want to tra change that data. And uh, so current medicine is aging is not defined as a disease. Uh, it's, it's not targeting root causes. 
What we want to look at future medicine would be different. If you actually go to your doctor today, your yearly physical, they'll say, oh, you're 50 now, time for your colonoscopy. Uh, maybe that'll be different. They say, well, you've got a particular genetic makeup that we should actually give you colonoscopy at 40. Uh, Katie Couric's husband has got this campaign to. Katie Couric has got this campaign to have more screening because her husband died much younger than the screening uh, uh, level. And so, uh, on the AI side, biomarkers. I did a whole day on it yesterday. I think there'll be more people talking about it today. There's all kinds of things you can get. I'm not sure if anyone's tried this uh, by Alex Javanovsky at Aging.ai. You can take your blood uh, metrics and. Uh, uh, that you take in, uh, one, one every year, that in the physical, and you can stick them into aging.ai. Uh, they've got European measures and uh, uh, American measures, and uh, it'll tell you how old you are. Um, oops, where's it going? Uh, right. And so the idea is then get personalized treatments for you and not the general case. So what is a vaccine for aging? So what do I mean by a vaccine? So historically, vaccines are really applied to the immune system. The body is given a dead pathogen or a weak pathogen to give the body a chance to practice so when it sees the real thing, it can actually uh, uh, take action. Uh, I really want to elevate that definition. So when we first invented vaccines, the immune system was what we wanted to optimize for and what we work on. We have now more tools available to us. We have genomics, we have transcriptomics, we have gene editing. We want to actually use the same concept of what a vaccine is to protect you from bad things. And bad things might be senescent cells. Senescent cells are old cells. Uh, usually the immune system clears them out. Uh, but if they don't clear them out, they block your arteries, that all sorts of things uh, happen to you. Uh, if you tend to uh, remove these old cells, you've got younger mouse, faster mouse, uh, stronger mice uh, to do things. And this goes to some work that people are thinking of the concept of a vaccine. It's this work from Minamino in Japan uh, to says, well, okay, can we find a gene marker? And he's found a gene marker, GP, the GPNMB gene, to actually attack and then clear those cells out once we can mark those cells. Because the problem is, if you have a drug, you might be able to get rid of the senescent cells, but you'll get rid of the healthy cells too. And that's the difficulty that we want to try and solve. And um, his results on mice, very good. Uh, this is an arteriosclerosis, uh, clears them out. The problem is, does it work on every organ? Uh, do we actually uh, have a signature that can cover many, many organs, many, many diseases? And my belief is it's going to be a cocktail that you're going to have to do that. And so this is where Agemica comes in. It's a project that's looking at uh, uh, gene expression data, looks, tries to look at multiple pathways to find signatures across uh, many, many uh, diseases. And so anyone can come with a computational platform but, and come up with a list of things that can help you, but can it actually help you? And, uh, you, know, you don't really know for another 15 years whether uh, the trials will actually work. So what we did here was we said, OK, we know what drugs are currently used for lots and lots of diseases. Uh, can we actually predict those drugs blinded without actually knowing uh, the information uh, purely from databases that we actually have? And it turns out our platform does. It actually does do that, uh, clearly in the top 10 level. And it doesn't mean our top one doesn't work, but the standard of care peers in the top 10. So the idea is come out with a vaccine that is sort of open. It could be a set of drugs, it could be a supplement. And then use machine learning to actually uh, give this trick one to increase the probability. So we invented another company, Superbio, which has uh, a thousand different machine learning libraries that uh, you can just upload data and click train and not write any code. This is an accelerator. This is an accelerant. So you don't actually have to have a degree in artificial intelligence to actually use artificial intelligence. Suddenly, you don't need a degree in biology to use these systems. It's the, it's the same idea. That's trick one. Trick two, drug repurposing. Uh, use existing drugs. Because the existing drugs have all got passed through safety, uh, they have all passed through uh, some level of approval. Uh, we have to get it faster, because even if you increase the probability of success, 
you still have the trials. So we have to sort of increase, uh, decrease that time. Okay, let's see. Uh, we'll flick through. Uh, yeah, mitochondria. Uh, is there something uh, I'm, I'm making a big bet on? Uh, can we actually improve our mitochondria? Mitochondria are the battery packs of our cells. As we get older, the integrity becomes weaker. Can we replace our mitochondria? Can we get new ones? Uh, and this comes back to uh, the, uh, this is from Metrix, where maybe the body, you can think of it as a laptop. You have to replace the battery, which is your mitochondria. You have to get rid of the senescent cells, which is your dirt and dust. And then you have to reprogram the operating system, do epigenetic reprogramming. And can we do that by ourselves in a combination? Uh, and can we do it quickly? Some of you here, you've got time. Some of us haven't got time. So uh, we've got to uh, do it in finite time. Maybe we can get a better result. <laughs>